Hello everybody, we've got a real treat for you here. Phil Pask, the absolute legend of physio. He's been at the cutting edge of sports science in this country since 1997 and has been the senior physio for every single England rugby campaign since. And this is unheard of. He also established the most successful and long-standing physio clinic in the county. When he's not physically working, he's improving himself mentally and physically. His relentless pursuit and infectious enthusiasm are an absolute inspiration. Enjoy. First question, um, from obviously a wealth of knowledge, um, tell us a little bit about the differences between the role of physio in the private sector uh, versus the elite sporting sectors. That's an interesting question actually, Fred, because there's not that much of a difference really. Um, our skill sets are the same, the way you manage people are, are the same. Um, it's probably just uh, the expectations of, of your clients may be slightly different, but I'm not even so sure of that really. So I tend to use that F1 analogy, Formula One. So the guys in Formula One, they, they spend 200 million pounds, don't you, on a car to get it so it can go as fast and as economic and all the as it can to win the world championship. So they're cutting edge all the time and they bring that technology back into your I'm going to say Ford Capri. They don't make those anymore, do they? <laughs> Into your Renault Vespas or Renault Twingos. So all that technology at the top end gets filtered down. And, and I think possibly one of the differences between um, when we're out working with the elite athletes, we, we tend to be looking at what's out there all the time and trying to innovate and bring stuff in. And then for me personally, I, I then bring that back into my, my clinical practice and share that amongst the physios like yourself that we we talk to and, and we take all the good bits and that filters down into private practice. The, the thing you've got to be aware, uh, be, be aware of in a private practice is that you don't become a bit obsolete and become a little bit um, isolated, you know, working it on your own, so under pressure or in, even in the hospital environment, pressure of time, pressure of getting your patients through. Sometimes you don't get that interaction with other people. But within the elite sport, we work in a very integrated, as you know, an open environment where I'm always working uh, with an earshot and, and vision of my next physio, the S&C, the coaches, the, the diet and nutritionist. The, it's, we get the holistic type of approach. So again, that's probably one of the things that, that separates what we can do in that environment and what you can do uh, at, your, at your practice. That's great. So I think, well, I, I, I can, if I can, do you want me to go on? Because the other thing yeah. I do notice is, maybe a little bit of difference in the patients as well. So the, the professional guys, actually, that's unfair. Probably all sports people tend to catastrophize when they get an injury. It's always much worse than you think. But then they always go on to underestimate <laughs> the length of time to recover. So it's, oh, it's massively bad, but you've got to get me back nah. as quick as you can. <laughs> and, and that's possibly more acute when you're working with the guys uh, at the elite end. Yeah. So is, do you almost find you're having to um, take that, that top 1% and almost um, scale it back for, or scale it to the, the sort of general population when it comes into... I think, yeah, a, a nice way I try and phrase it to my patients is, look, when I give them their exercise sheet, it's quite daunting, or some of the exercises are quite difficult or whatever. I say, look, I'm giving, I, I know you probably won't be able to do all this, but this is your gold standard. This is what we do with our tennis player, footballer, you know, so you do as best you can. But if you start at the, the highest um, denominator, then you hopefully will get your guys to buy in at a, at a level that's going to make them better. Yeah, I think that's about right. I want to see, see how much sticks. Do you find, yeah. so um, imagine in, even in with the elite players, like you say, there's this massive catastrophization and then, but I've got to be better now. Yeah. There's commitment vary to the program because obviously private practice you see it a lot you get the, the people who overdo it underdo it is it the same in the elite elite level um i think compliance is your main your main issue um it's actually quite easy for us um, when we've got a team and we, we're there with us and we're their physio uh, or strength conditioner all the time compliance is quite easy because we've got them all the time but when you're seeing someone once a week or twice a week or once a fortnight and you're giving them an exercise program to do at home, away from you, without coaching. Mm. You know, it's quite tough. And I think, I think this lockdown has really taught me a few things by doing the virtual clinics by Zoom. Um, 
compliance has actually gone up, in my opinion. So I'm giving exercise programs over, we're watching people perform uh, their rehab at home in, in their own environment. They're very comfortable uh, in their own kit. They're not in front of someone, you know, they're taking the clothes off in front of someone else in a, in a building they don't really know. They've got their own equipment that they're using at home anyway. Uh, I've actually found that it's been quite motivational for, for a lot of my guys. So I think the compliance level's uh, gone up. It'll be interesting to see what happens when we go back into hands-on again, face-to-face, and we're giving people, bringing them in, giving them exercise and going away, whether that compliance level drops off. That's going to be an interesting bit of a learning curve, Fred, that actually. 100% agree with that. Yeah, the compliance is definitely, people got, they have, potentially have more time, but also you've done it in their home environment then and there so they can visualize, right, we'll do that on the sofa, I'll do this, balancing against there, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think they, and I think they value the fact that you, you're given 100% co- concentration on what they're doing and correcting them. So good coaching or physio s and um, And yeah, they're, in com- they're comfortable because it's their own environment. Yeah. And, you know, I'll be having people, so they'll, they'll have a partner or a, uh, someone that's close to them taking the video or helping. So they've got someone there who's encouraging them to, to do it as well because they, they the actual guy holding the camera seems to be yeah they seem to be buying into the whole process as well yeah yeah um yeah how many people got attacked by children and pets when you were, when you were doing yeah, there's, a dog, there's a dog or a cat in every yeah. every assessment i've done a it's ridiculous. <laughs> um what would your advice be uh to physios looking to work in the that that elite sporting environment um a couple of pieces, you gave me time to think about this. I think the couple of take home, the real couple of things that might, might help is when you're, firstly, when you're first qualified or you've got this drive to become and work in sports medicine or with, within sports or the sort of stuff that you do and I do, the first thing you've got to do is get your hands dirty. So when you've qualified, you've got all this knowledge, it's all in there. You probably know more at that stage theoretically than any other part of your career but you have no hands-on skill, I'm sorry, uh, experience. You need to get out there, you know, go and work the club, volunteer yourself out there. It's the hard yards, we call it. Go and work for Wellingborough Rugby Club, Rugby Rugby Club. They're, rugby players are great to work with because they'll let you, they're, they're, or a soccer club, a gym team, or just go and, and treat as many people as you can, sporting people. Have an, get an empathy for, for the sport you're going to work in or a whole spectrum of sports um but get out there treat a thousand people as quick, quickly as you can get but you may it may not be of any you may not get paid for this this is where you're gonna have to earn you know uh, that experience so don't be shy of doing that and you'll be surprised how grateful teams are um, and individuals are for you for you lending that expertise to them and the second thing that goes along with that is get as many strings on your bow as you can Fred. So what I, if you want my, what I did, um, because I was, I was at an advantage being having already got a degree in uh, sports and exercise science, uh, sports science, um, I went out and, and got as many coaching qualifications, right? Not medical, uh, mm. particularly biased, but I thought I'll, I'll go and become a netball umpire. Uh, uh, got my badge for, for the football. Obviously, I got my rugby stuff. That was all, all right. So I did tennis, volleyball, swimming. So after the first five or six years of post-grad, I'd suddenly got, I think I've got about 12 coaching, quote, coaching qualifications. Oh man, that's helped me so much. Because if I get someone in that comes in and then wants me, them, uh, me to understand what the demands of their sport are, I've actually got half an idea. So I can set up a badminton drill or a squash drill or something that means something to the guy that's coming in. And as soon as they buy into the fact you know a little bit more about what you're talking about, then they'll let you get on with with your job, which is you know the the physiotherapy input and the S and C input. So I think those two things get your hands dirty, uh, and and outside of the medical stuff that your CPD, go and get something that makes you different, gives you a point of difference, um, things like co- coaching qualifications. Yeah, help me really yeah. really well. How much of a difference does it make when when somebody comes in and they've and you can talk to them on a level about their own sport? And you've got a bit of insight into the mechanics of and, and the demands of it, even from a um, you know a, a, that return to play side of things, as well as knowing the mech or having a little bit of insight into the mechanism of, of injury. Yeah, and and that's you've just hit the nail on the head there because it's the re, 
it's a return to training and the return to playing and the return to performance. Actually, that is the key with our guys. Yeah. The physiotherapy, the basic, you know, the price of the protect, right, uh, rest, ice, compression, elevation, rehab bits, we're all pretty decent at that. But you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have qualified. It's actually how you translate that into how do you get them back on the training field safely and sensibly and how do you then make them uh, be able to uh, be able to play safely and sensibly, but then also how to be, be able to perform at the best. And that's what will set you apart from, um, from others. Yeah. Um, what, what are your, on that, what are your thoughts uh, on the importance of rehab uh, versus the manual therapy side of stuff? Um, and have you seen yeah. that change yeah. in your career? That is interesting. Um, I have changed my mind a little bit, actually, through the lockdown with the use of the, um, the uh, virtual clinics. Um, however, I was always a, a firm believer that you should not, the, the, you've got to promote self-reliance in your player, client or patient. So with, with, it, with England, our coaches, will, we don't want dependent uh, players, dependent on anything, and that includes medicine. So they are not reliant upon me. And now in, in the past, um, I think possibly a lot of medical practitioners have been at fault of making their athletes, particularly athletes, quite dependent on them as therapists. Yeah. And I'm not going to, I don't want to give chiropractors and osteopaths bad names, but physios can, uh, can be as bad, at, uh, uh, bad or as good at, at, well, you need to come back, need to come back, need to come back. Well, actually, if you give them enough knowledge and empowerment enough and, and, and you're able to, they should be able to then look after themselves. Yeah. So I want to get rid of my patients as quickly as I can so they can get on with their rehabilitation. Yeah, obviously, you're still going to need at times to do your, your soft tissue treatments. You're still going to need at times to do your manual mobilization, stretching and strengthening and stuff. It does have a part. But for me, it's taken a, a small percentage of what I do whilst the rehab side of it has got bigger, bigger and bigger. Yeah, but again, that's probably experience as well because I'm quite old now. So <laughs> you've learned what works and doesn't work, thrown out the stuff that doesn't work so well, and kept in the bits that does. So I think there might be a little bit of a, a shift there. And ironically, I, I'm not sure how um, education goes for for physios at the moment. But rehab was always a bit that was we weren't taught really very well. Sets and reps. I mean, it's the plucking numbers and exercises out out of the the air really. Yeah, it wasn't until I've got involved and gone on and got some experience that it, it all became uh, clear. What? Um, what? Yeah, just on that in terms of the um, the educational side of things. Yeah, do you think there needs to be more of a, a weighting towards rehab and, and S and C techniques? Yeah, I do. I, I do actually. I honestly do. So um, I'm very lucky. I'm a visiting lecturer to uh, UCL, but uh, University of Bedfordshire as well, with Professor Ian Griffiths. Um, sorry, Professor Ian Fletcher. Sorry, Ian. Uh, runs a department out there. Fantastic um, department over in Bedford. Um, but I go in to talk to their MSc <clears throat> postgrad physio and SNC guys, and the actual title of the lecture is uh, <laughs> "It's Taking the Theory into Practice." That's what it is. So I actually go in and do a half theory, half practical. Well, you know. This is stage one, you know, or stage two, three, four, whatever of your rehab. This is what it looks like. And we just go through progressions. Um, and it's an eye opener for some of the guys. So how you stage the loading, the speed, frequency, intensity, but actually how you physically do it. So they've got the theory, but it's how you do progress the loading through your left hip from the onset of injury all the way through to your return to play. So I actually do that with them. Um, and so, and it go, it's well received, Fred, as well. It's a real, and I've done this also for, for orthopedic surgeons, you know, with Professor Griffin and, and with Bill Ribbons over at Warwick. And these guys who are, you know, renowned specialists in uh, sports medical medicine, um, they never very rarely get to see what, what goes on and what can be achieved on the ground level. And yeah. uh, so, yes, it's massively important. Do you think that um, that knowledge on the orthopedic side of things? Do you think that knowledge helps guide some of their clinical reasoning as well? You know, yes. what can be achieved either conservatively or what needs to be done post-operatively 
does that change their techniques and things? I think they didn't realise just how hard you can push. Uh, so one, how hard you have to push people, and two, how hard people can be pushed. Yeah, and that's a bit of an eye opener because you know we do. <laughs> this is great. So I was really big headed, but we can make surgeons look really good. No, and I, and I say that because Bill and, and Damien and, and Andy Williams in London have all said this to me, said, right, we've done the op, there they are, make yeah. me look good now. And it's quite, it's quite right, because you get this big swollen joint, don't you? And yeah. the bloke doesn't want to, or person doesn't want to do anything because it hurts too much. Yeah. And then you have to send them back six weeks later looking in good nick. Keeping in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, again, that's becoming far more integrated. And I think that's where we, need, we do need to move towards that. Uh, fully integrated approach to medicine, sports medicine in particular. I was gonna, I was gonna ask this a little bit later on, but that kind of leads into it um, quite nicely in terms of, yeah, wh where or where do you see UK physio in terms of, you know, Australia, America? Um, are we are we chasing still chasing quite a lot? Uh, Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I couldn't. You sent me this as a question earlier, and I couldn't really come up with an answer, but. I think an analogy for you was, um, ironically, they've shown the 2003 World Cup on TV today, which is great. I don't look any, I don't look any difference. I didn't have any hair yeah. then, none now. Um, <laughs> I think Lee, probably up into the, when we went into professional rugby, so 97 up to 2003, we were always following, very much following what was going on in the Southern Hemisphere and in America because it was good and it still is good. But I think we've bridged the gap. I think we've bridged the gap in research, in uh, producing guys of very high uh, knowledge and level and expertise now. Um, whether we've fully caught up, I'm not sure, but I think it's a cult bit of a cultural thing. I think it's certainly in Australia and uh, New Zealand, South Africa, um, they're an outdoor nation. They're a sports nation. You know, we, we lost, well, it's in the news today, isn't it, with apparently we've got this obesity problem. Well, we've had this obesity problem since I was a student. Yeah. It was always, you know, health related fitness. Yeah. All the stuff that was done um, from the university of Loughborough and Exeter back in the seventies, when I was a first a student, it's not gone away. It's just, we've never acted on it. Whereas in Australia, New Zealand, they've always been very proactive in the health related fitness, not performance, but health related for the general population. Possibly not as much in America, but they've got big, bigger population, haven't they? Yeah. So I think they've, they've had more time, uh, more kudos, more money, better teaching um, facilities and establishments. So they've pushed the boundaries. So I think we caught up quite a bit, certainly in rugby by 2003. Yeah. But then possibly we've let it go a little bit again. And this is in rugby particularly, okay. because we thought we got there and it sort of slipped back a bit. And then we try, every World Cup we have another surge. And we, but we're generally getting better. It's like, it's, like, it's like an arms race, isn't it? Like World Cup, Olympics is, is tooling up, tooling up, tooling up, and then trying to uh, yeah. maintain, I, I suppose, or spread, disseminate that information down. Like you said in the first one, that F1 thinking, yeah. disseminate well, This, that is, this is what Clive Woodward, Clive Woodward um, wanted a succession after the 2003 World Cup because we'd suddenly, we spent money on lots of, well, we went fully integrated, didn't we? We had loads of coaches. Yeah. Line-out coach, kicking coach, uh, yeah, visual uh, awareness coach. We had a spatial awareness coach. We had, we, uh, but it worked, and we won. But it cost a lot of money, and so actually, he then had this battle with the RFU to fund the, for the next four years, and he got fed up with it because it wasn't there. Yeah. And Eddie's at each coach goes through this process, and Eddie Jones is at this now. So he's always looking for succession planning for the next World Cup because you don't want to get there and just drop off the edge at the end. Oh, we've won it. Brilliant. And then forget all the lessons from that. And it's the same in medicine. Right. When you have a success, then you need then, right, we've got that now. Look in the mirror and let's try to get the, to the next level. Yeah. And you should that, do that in your practice. So, you know, when you've had something that's worked, it's worked well, log it, remember it, then look to see how you can enhance and improve it. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where we're at now. And we've got some really bright people now in this country doing just that. Amazing. Where and that's yeah. Where where do you see kind of is that the future of the professions going? Is is working out those those um, the the biggest impact and building on it? I hope so. Um, I hope so. It's and it's up to us as as physios to push yeah. this. You know, once you're um, 
once you you've qualified and and you want to uh, improve and get better at what you're doing you, there's a massive commitment to life like lifelong education and cpd um to work in our environment and more the sport environment you if you don't move forward you stand still you get left behind yeah. so uh, again one piece of advice to everybody out there and i'm sure they're doing it and you're doing it anyway you have to have a thirst for knowledge a con uh, con you know continual professional development in service training but a drive um that's one thing um I'm actually now be, I'm learning stuff all the time. But when I learn something new, some of the old stuff disappears. <laughs> and I'm continually reminding myself what you... I forgot stuff that used to work. And I come across it every now and again and think, well, why did I stop doing that? <laughs> you've got to have that knowledge, you know. And, uh, and it's something that you commit to. And I think as a profession, we're pretty good at, at looking outside the box and at reading and trying to keep on top. Because you can become obsolete pretty quick and then you know you just fall behind and it's difficult when you're a lone practitioner or maybe a one or two in a private practice this is where you've really got to be strict with yourself you've got to go out you know and modern technology allows you to do that with podcasts and webinars and there's nothing better actually for me than working in an environment with other people yeah so i'll take the best you watch me work you probably not take anything i'll watch you work and i'll take all your best bits and put it <laughs> into my practice but that's not a bad thing. You know, you should never, don't be dogmatic. You need to, you know, just take the best of everything that you see and put it into your practice and, and enhance your own, your own practice. That way the whole profession is going to move, move forward. So we need to share, we need to share whatever information we've got. So that's the way we need to move forward as a profession, Fred. How, and how, how do you obviously, you know, basically the spear tip of this thing, how do you, how do you keep yourself sharp? Is it, is it again, is it looking around at others? Is it? Um... I think um, I've kept myself sharp by being adaptable. Um, I've adapted to the lockdown reason well. I'm still busy. I've, been, um, I've had eight England coaches and each coach has, had, has a different philosophy. I've had, you know, and at Saints, when I was at Saints, you have to adapt. And so, and we're good at that. Physios are good at adapting. Um, and I fully understand that I need to keep on top of, of my game. So I need to be looking out there. So that's not an issue. So, but the best thing is working with the guys that su su succeeded me with England. They're in the 30s and early 40s. They're driven guys. They've come through a different era. They know loads of stuff. So work, just working with these guys who come in and the people that we bring in to work with us, like Dave O'Sullivan, for example, you bring them in and it just, because you're seeing something different that works, different yeah. approach, that really motivates me. So actually going on on little courses, the big courses as well, but the little ones, just learning from people who are enthusiastic, enthusiastic and also experts in their field. And I think that that infectiousness, it rubs off, doesn't it? Definitely. You know, and hopefully, you know, talking to you, Fred, you have the same, you know, when you, I'm a lot older than you, but you can see how enthusiastic I still am. Hopefully that will rub off on you. And that'll rub off on your the guys that work with you. I mean, so we can sort of generate this um, yeah. this enthusiasm for what we do. I mean, I think you know the um, the passion for and, and just the natural kind of innate interest in in you know how how does it work? Why does it work? What does it what does that do? Why is this person doing that? And look, yeah. is why is it working? That always be curious, never be dogmatic. Yeah. Nothing that makes me more angry is when someone tells you this is what you should do. Yeah. Be Eddie Jones's favorite quote, quote or uh, mantra is be open minded as yeah. much as you can. I flip between open minded and closed minded, but try and be open minded as much as you can. Don't dismiss anything. Take the good bits and then the stuff you don't really believe in, then you just leave that behind. Yeah. But that way, if you keep an open-minded approach, you're always going to be learning stuff. You're always going to be enth uh, enthused because you're going to see stuff that's new all the time. Um, got, yeah, yeah. yeah. Motivated colleagues, motivated patients. And yeah, uh, and yeah then it yeah. drives itself because everyone's getting... getting. I'm going to hammer the integrate. Anyone's heard me talk before, they know I'm, I'm massive passionate about being integrated. Yeah, don't work on your own. Talk to your SNC guys that you know. Talk to your other physios and your colleagues. Talk to the diet nutritionists, the orthopods, the orth and, but talk to them about the job and, and learn from learn from those. Don't try and sort it all out yourself by doing you know by reading journals yeah. and reading research. Don't do that, but don't just do that. 
get out there and have a conversation because the conversa- the conversations are, are where you learn. Uh, where I where certainly I've learned most. Yeah, um, it's 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 hard, isn't it? I think a lot of the time, particularly if you're maybe new to the profession or, or not sure of, of a direction to take when you're young, it's it's hard to kind of reach out and ask ask those yeah. those difficult questions. But it is, you know, and and it shouldn't be. Um, we're um, is it, there's a great quote, isn't it? There's nothing, no such thing as a stupid question. Yeah, well, there are, but there aren't. There aren't actually, and and I don't mind at all anyone asking me anything. One, it challenges me to think to actually justify what I'm doing, but two, it's quite, it just shows that willingness to learn from the guy that's asking. You know, we had all those students over to one of the Northampton sports medicine uh, groups at um, at Malton. Coach Lowe came over, didn't they, from commentary? Yeah. You know, they asked more questions um, after the, le- the lecture was finished. And it's infectious, that enthusiasm. I thought, this is, this is brilliant. They yeah. don't want the in-depth detail because they, they haven't got to there yet, but they're asking all the right questions that is going to get them there. Yeah, so that, hopefully those conversations have, have, have steered them in the right direction. What about, what about yourself? What was, what was the best advice you you kind of had when you were when you were starting yeah, out i I, uh, I did look at that and i thought well i'm getting old Fred. i can't remember what people told me 35 <laughs> years ago uh, the best bit of advice i had was from a doctor uh called phil batty dr phil batty he was manchester city's doctor and he came to work with england for a bit uh and now he works at one of the big institutes down in london lovely bloke from up north somewhere but he said look phil you're patient doesn't care how much you know until he knows how much you care. And I don't know if you've heard that before. So they don't, you know, it's dead right. You, your patients don't care how much you know until they know how much you care about getting them better. That's fantastic. That's, yeah. yeah. Well, they, they assume you've got, a, you know, you're qualified. But unless you show an empathy with your patient, you're not going to get better, not to the level you want to. Yeah. So the first thing I do when um, I see a, a new play patient at my practice or an, um, a player I'm not familiar with is I sit down there for 10 minutes and and just convince them that I do care about them yeah. you know or we even get to um, because we understand that they're catastrophizing yep. at that stage but their expectations are probably way off and, and at some stage you've got to manage those expectations and you don't want to do it by dis, disenchanting them do you Brilliant. So there you go. So I think that's a decent quote to throw at you. Love that. Yeah. I think it um, comes back to that adaptability you spoke of. How, how much do you find, obviously, you know, a wealth of, of clinical knowledge and, and that, but also being able to uh, understand and uh, uh, empathise with the individual in front of you, knowing that human being in front of you and how to get their interest in what, what they need to do. I think um, one thing we've probably not been great at as physios in the past, certainly not sports medicine, is um, is the mindfulness side of things and the power of uh, understanding people's emotions um, and how they. Well, we we were all familiar with about you know trying to work out how people learn, whether they're tact, you know, was it visual, audio, kinesthetic, tactile, whatever. And we, so we can work those out, but do we fully understand how their brain works in terms of how they perceive the world they perceive their injury yeah. perceive where you know it's that um we again the fear avoidance how many of your patients come in and they're frightened to do stuff because yeah. pain to them is is harm it's doing no good whereas to my players at our end they can get past the pain bit because they've been there before they know it's not you know that particular pain is not harmful. They need to move through it to get to the next level. Very difficult in your private practice unless you understand the individual. So you've got to use those, those um, your skills now to, to understand your patient. Um, an interesting one is we, we've been doing a lot of re- research and, and working on recovery is a massive thing with us. Yeah. So from, from intense training, intense rehab, intense training, whatever, to recover the guy so that they can go again. And there's a whole wealth of research and, uh, and stuff out there that says, you know, for, you can, well, ice baths, contrast bathing, cycling, sh- uh, active recovery, compression garments might, ha- you know, might have a role. 
but actually patting someone on the back after a game and saying he had a great game can promote wellness and healing nearly as much. It's a very individual thing. So we've come to the conclusion that that recovery is very person specific. So why shouldn't the approach to how you manage them post injury has to be tailored to that individual? And that might be completely different from one patient to your next patient in your patient client list to the next one. So in a de- in a morning's work at your practice, you might have to adapt five different approaches to get the best result for your, um, and that's it, not even thinking about the physio um, you know, man- manual and uh, the other bits and pieces that we do with the patients. How, how big a role it's is it? Fascinating, isn't it? Yes, it's, I know we weren't going to get technical with this, but just a, a talking a little bit on the recovery side of stuff. Um, how much do you, has that been a, a huge growing area, particularly at the, the, the elite level, that the, the quality of recovery and getting the most from that training stimulus? Is Absolutely that- massive. We spend more time recovering than we do training. Yeah. Um, because we want, ad- we want our players to adapt, get stronger, fitter, faster, more powerful or whatever. Yeah. So if you're going to do a strength training session, you don't want them using ice baths. You want, actually want to go pro. You want to heat them up, get the blood flow through the tissue to adapt. Bizarre, isn't it? But if they're out there bashing each other up, you don't want to put them in heat. You want to put them in something that's cooler to, to minimise the amount of bruising. So you've got to be quite smart. You know, we've got, we're lucky. We've got the budget to do it, but we've had everything from in, infrared compression garments to we've got our cryotherapy chambers, which I personally hate. <laughs> but for me, um, a contrast shower, hot coal, hot coal, and a bit of active exercise, and I'm right as rain. Yeah. So you have to be smart and work out what's going to work for the guy in front of you, for the person in front of you. And, and like you said there, you, you're looking at the, it's a chain, movable feast, isn't it? So one week, you might, right, we're going to heat you up after here, but oh no, now you've had seven bells knocked out of each other on the, on the, on the training pitch, and so now you can't eat them up. So it's, it's not, not a, a cookie cutter answer. No, it's interesting how, um, and it's changed all the time. So we, we obviously keep our eye on the research that's out there, and um, it does change all the time, you know, uh, how cold, how long, how warm, how long, how deep the water needs, you know, how long you have to sit on a, a bike. You know, Johnny Wilkinson, brilliant example. So he, after a game, he would uh, sit in the change rooms. So he'd go and sit on a bike for 10, 20 minutes um, on his own. But that was part of his mental de-stressing as well. Do a little spin. Then he'd go jump in the, um, the shower, hot, cold shower, five minutes in the ice bath, put his compression garments on. That was him done. But it probably bought him the time. Um, to uh, to calm down mentally as well as physically emotionally as well as physically yeah. uh, by the end of that period we've got an idea of, of which bits we might need to be working on the next day he's got a nice idea of what, how fit and healthy he is going into um, the next day recovery before we play the game the next week yeah fascinating fascinating hey, stuff love it um, that's I mean that's something in private practice personally yeah trying to hammer that message home how important recovery is and 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 you know allowing your body to adapt to the stimulus with before hitting it again is is something that we we do struggle to get that point across i think sometimes um but the, you know when somebody buys into it and and wow um well we're going to have a problem after the lockdown because everybody's going to train themselves to death because of that much time we're going to have that many bad elbows and backs and <laughs> The phones have been going off with the gyms, gyms going back open. Yeah, everybody's just gone like this with their loads. They've just spiked them. Surely all that rest has made me stronger. I shall get to go in PR. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone could, anyone that's been training through lockdown could probably have a fortnight off now. and They'll be much better for it. Totally. <laughs> um, brilliant. Okay, so um, how about from a, um, the most uh, influential person in your in your professional life currently crikey um yeah difficult one um it was easier in my early career um i had some really good mentors but they would mean no nothing to you at all people who had faith in me when i didn't really have that faith and i'm sure we've all got people out there when you're at college the person that saw something in you that um that when you were at a low ebb 
sort of give you that little kick or that little pat on the back that got you going. So I've got a, I've got a few of those. Professionally, I remember I've been at this for 35 years, so there have been people along the way, and a lot of those people have been influential with me are people I've worked with. Yeah. So there'll be physios like Barney Kenny, who I worked with for a number of years with England, Richard, uh, uh, well, his name's Krychek, um, spelled W-E-G-R-Z-Y-K, you try pronouncing that. Soft tissue therapist who worked with, with England and the Lions. You know, you can't help. These guys are driven uh, and work workaholics. Uh, the, the work, I think the work, work ethics I picked up early, working with guys who are, they're so driven, you know, they'll work the hours they need to work. Yeah. Probably wasn't that efficient, actually, but it, it served a purpose at the time. So you get the work ethic, and once that's in, then you pick up people, you know, like courses with Stuart McGill or, you know, uh, all, all the, co- the oh, I've been on so many d- different courses from, you know, from acupuncture to dry needling, that side of it. Through to work with people like Dave O'Sullivan, who's contemporary now, looking at... Um, at a sympathetic nervous driver, sympathetic autonomic driving for um, aiding um, postural control and movement and, and recovery from injury. You know, the stuff that's way out there, yeah. but seems to work as well. So I've had a lot of, of little bump, a little kicks along along the way. Uh, but I think the, the, the person, and this sounds all, probably sounds a bit big headed, but it's not, it's not meant to be. I'm my own. Yeah, most influential person because of the goals I've set, yeah. you know, um, and I've tried to be realistic and haven't at times. But I think I've you have to be, you know, you do need that hug and that stick in the carrot every now and again. Yeah. And someone out there that you really admire as a therapist and stuff. But actually, when it all boils down to it, you've got to be your own um, biggest influence on, yeah. on what goes on. Talk, can you talk us through maybe a little bit of the the goal setting process? Is it is it something that you um, just doggedly go for? Is, does it change? Is does it depend on? Yeah, it has over the years. It's depend. It has changed a bit on my um, on my interests. But then when the game went professional, I thought, well, I better know. So a job, I had a job sheet. Can't do it all in one year. What what am I going to need to to be able to do to be effective at my job? And that hasn't changed, actually. So, you know, our CPD every year, I do an old-fashioned um, SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, based on what I think I need to be uh, the best to deliver at what I do. That's really, for me, it's targeted for the international, for rugby, England rugby. That's where it, that's, uh, but then that filters down like the F1 into my practice. Yeah. Um, but what we tend to do, and you might want to do this in your practice or your bigger practices, we sit down as a group. So I sit down with the doctor, the soft tissue therapist, the S&C guys, the doctor and our other physios. And we say, right, uh, we, on one side, we've got a whole list of everything you can do in sports medicine, S&C. And then we tick off. We've got our names across the top. and We tick off what we've got. So we've got the skill sets, not only as individuals, but what we've got across the whole team. Yeah. And then we identify little areas of, of weakness, things we don't, you know, it might be, it might well be hips or knees or neurovascular or visceral, whatever. So we, we look at areas where, we've not, where we, we're not as strong as a group and then we tend to divvy them out amongst ourselves where we're interested. It's quite a neat way of doing it, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so, really. So you yeah. look as a, as a group... Yeah, yeah. You get because as an individual, I've, I've, I've done so much CPD. I've covered, ticked a lot of my boxes. But now to be as effective as a team unit, as a practice in your case, yeah. or my practice, or but particularly as a team, for Eddie Jones, Eddie Jones wants the best skill set he's got and mixed yeah. within his medical, oh, his performance team as he can. And it's a neat way of doing it, actually, Fred. You'd be surprised what gets thrown up when you sit down and, and you make a list of all the things that are out there that you could uh, add. Yeah. And you'd be amazed how many people have, have already done bits that you haven't thought yeah. about. And then you're in service training and your own, your own driven continual professional development as a, as a group. Um, it's very useful for that as well. And then, yeah, as a unit, you've got a hugely diverse offering. And, and I suppose you can pick up, pick up anything then. 
Oh, yeah. you know, in my pra- in our practice in Northampton, we've got guys who uh, are, who love their shoulders. We've got guys who love their hips. We've got guys who like athletes. Don't understand why they like athletes. Like Mark <laughs> Marco. But um, we we should be tapping each other, you know, and they, we should because I, I, I like my strengths at the top end of the rehab thing. Yeah. So we should be asking each other questions, and we should be learning from each other because yeah. we've actually already got that skill set then, and I'm sure it's the same at, at your practice and and all the guys that are listening to this as well. Yeah, absolutely. The um, do you do you find a bit of the um, inter so within the clinic you're referring to to each other. Um, or we do, yeah, we do. It, it it's not always been like that, and physios can be criticised for being overprotective of their mm-hmm. patients. And I was the same, I'm sure, when I when I first started. So I want to keep a a, a player. I want to keep them from the in, onset of the injury till they got back to play. And I didn't want to share them with the S and C or other physios, but that was entirely wrong. Yeah, you should bring in all these other guys as early as you can into the process. And you should really uh, get as much case case review and case conference your patients as often as you can, mm. because even now I miss the obvious, yeah. and, and it's too late once you've gone past that critical time period. Yeah. So even now um, with England, we will sit down each week and we'll go through all our key players that we're working on. We'll go. We'll tell the group what we're doing, and you'll be amazed what good ideas come back yeah. but you mustn't take it personally that you've you've just not going to be dogmatic you've just got to take take in the and it's constructive criticism yeah so let you let your ego go and just be prepared to ask those stupid questions but, but be prepared to um, to get good constructive uh, input from people who might have just seen the thing that you're missing with a previous patient and this worked it's amazing yeah. how much you can learn at one light bulb mostly it happens all the time you know People will ring me up and they're embarrassed at times and say, I just want to run this past you. And I might just say, have you thought of this one thing? And think, oh, no, but that's right. Thank you. But, yeah. And that's it. And unless you go out and ask, yeah. then it's lost. Fantastic. Yeah. So career, career high and uh, career low. Oh, crikey. <laughs> it's probably not. not I'm going to my notes here because it, that's not. Oh, yeah. I remember what I put for this. It's not as easy as you think. Um, I'm not telling you about the lows because they're the people I didn't get right. <laughs> um, I mean, it's um, in sport or in, in, in personal practice. I mean, career highs, the, the building, our Richard Pascom Buckingham um, physio, working with Paul Whitty and then bringing Mark in and, and the guys working there to see the, just to see the practice grow and grow and grow. I mean, that's, that's always a, a high you know because it's all that hard work you know you're on the foothills with 30 odd years into it now that's that's great um from a physio this is yeah the the ones i remember that i was really patting myself on the back for <laughs> which is a high isn't it was uh, the first one was george or, or northampton please george north when um he tore his hamstring um in uh we, uh, he was the uh, lions tour of australia and it was good tear, Radiology, radiologically it was good tear, but we did a great bit of work with him. And he came back, played the second test against Australia, scored, ran the length of pitch, scored a try, and my heart was in my mouth because it was flat out. And he picked up his, his real fellow and dumped him on the floor. Brilliant. You know, I was actually doing a lap of honour when he, when he scored that try. Because really, you're never quite sure, are you? But that yeah. was a great bit of work. Um, same with Alex Corbusiero, who... Um, uh, what I think it was the same same tour tour his little tear in his calf. Um, no pressure here. Graham Roundtree, the coach, came and said, "If you get him right, we'll win this series." This is about five days before. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> really, just what I want. Um, anyway, he he did get he he was good enough to go and play and perform, and and we won the series. So you always think, yeah. We, so take the best bits of those rehabs. And then the one that always sticks out in my mind is, you might remember this, 2007 World Cup, although you're a bit young, Jason Robinson uh, tore his hamstring against uh, South Africa, running across the pitch. Classic, grabs his leg, forced the floor. The game's, actually, the game stopped because the South Africans could have kicked the crap out of him, but they, <laughs> even they thought Jason Robinson were better. <laughs> uh, and then we had uh, 
had a, two weeks to get him right, and it was a decent tear. But he's got so much muscle in his. You yeah. look at his. You watch his hamstrings. Hamstrings are huge. He's um, you know, got a little tear. You know, biggish tear. But anyway. <laughs> then he played against Australia two weeks later, and we beat Australia in the semi-final of a World Cup we should never have got to the final in. So you know, th- things like that. They're the things that really. They really keep you going. They, you know, they make up for all the the long hours, the weekends, of, you know, not seeing your family, spending six months in a hotel. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 all the highs, and they make you forget the lows anyway. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, massive. But all this behind the scenes stuff, you know, you see that they see the player fall down on the pitch, and then there's a all you know bit of. Um, uh, wondering, you know, what what has happened, and then bang, they're suddenly back on all cylinders. Yeah. Like, you see, you lot, you lot all know because you you can see the injury, but <laughs> you're, you know, your normal television, a rugby sports fan, they haven't got a clue, have they? You know, I, I watch football matches in horror, and some of the injuries. <laughs> <laughs> First thing that comes to my mind is, oh, there's a bit of work there for a physio or a performance team. They've got some work to do. <laughs> Um, now you've obviously saying about the size of, of Jason Robertson's um, hamstrings there. You've, you've been around some strong boys. You're a machine yourself. Who? No, um, who's the strongest? Who's a standout beast? Uh, Andy Sheridan. Yeah. Do you remember him? Yes. Sale prop went to France. Shares, shares. Oh, his dad was a powerlifter, so he started powerlifting when he was quite a, a young guy. Wow. I made a classic mistake with him. He was doing. Uh, a, a stiff leg deadlift with what I thought was a flex spine, right? And uh, with ridiculous amount of weight, I'm yeah. talking 250 300 k's reps. Yeah, and I'm watching him on a video because he, he was very, he's actually a very bright guy as well. So you couldn't do anything with him unless you actually justified what you're doing with it. Yeah, I said, Mate, you, you're gonna hit your back here. He says, No, I'm not. He says, You are, you're, you're in flexion. He said, No, I'm not. And, uh, and I broke it down, it wasn't, it was just his muscle bulk. Oh, really? Everything was coming off the hip. He was so strong. Just the sheer bulk of the... Yeah. yeah this the guy, um, we had some... Re- Actually, me and him got him really well, despite all this. He, um, he hurt his shoulder. He got his shoulder pain. So his shoulder's not right. And I assessed him and so it looked all right. And he was playing with it. Um, he could shoulder press 70 kg dumbbells. This is how strong this guy is. Yeah. yeah. Rep And rep him. So you could do this, fully torn supraspinatus tendon. Huh? So, you, you, I mean, that's, that was a massive learning curve for me. <laughs> so my threshold of, you know, suspicions just changed completely. So these guys, he was pushing 70 kg dumbbell shoulder press with a full, and fully torn. And you, you had to have it reattached a lot. They've been playing with this. Amazing, isn't it? That's how strong some of these boys are. And they're getting stronger all the time now because of what? you boys you s and c boys are doing to them yeah whether it's healthy long term <laughs> yeah. the time will tell won't it absolutely well that's i suppose there the the one area will improve fast and the rest has got to catch up yeah. so you've got this these guys getting stronger faster but now with the emphasis is on recovery injury yes i think we're going to go look more athletic ability again yeah. Uh, the other guy I'm gonna, I'll leave with who's very strong, never pushed the weight, was Manu, really. Um, so he could, he could go on a bench press and bench press 220 without doing any. Really? No, no just natural. It's ridiculous, yeah. yeah. Mind you, it was, he was only half as strong as his brother. <laughs> so uh, it's probably his sister was stronger than him as well. Yeah. <laughs> Genetics, they're monsters, monsters. Um, all right, funniest player. For this player, uh, I've narrowed this down for you to James Haskell. Yeah. He's one of those, you know, one of those people. He's got the gift of the gap. He never shuts up. Yeah. He mostly talks rubbish, yeah. but never get in an argument with him because he can just come back at you. It's just not worth it. So we basically, I'll throw in, a, I'll throw in something every now and again. He'll go off, he'll go off on one. He has a whole room in stitches. I just let him go. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, he's very, but he's very respective of me. I bet he should be. He's to, to batter him. <laughs> a... Exactly. We always get our own back somewhere, don't we? <laughs> Sometime. I think was a, there was a story he he was talking about on 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 one of his podcasts. It was about you guys. Um, <laughs> I went, you know, white water rafting like a team building thing yeah there was no white there was no white water so we ended up it was just literally a fight between each of the boats <laughs> as we floated down this river yeah i got him by the throat 
he got me by the throat. I'm, no literally, I'm trying to pull him off his boat. <laughs> Luke Karen Dickey emerges from nowhere, just lands on both of us, and now they're huge. Now I'm pinned <laughs> to the bottom of the river. I'm literally, I can't get out. Yeah. Just sat on top of me. I'm thinking, <laughs> someone can I hold my breath here? Yeah. And eventually, I sort of I bobbled up 400 yards down the down the river. But oh god, they're monsters. They're like little baby elephants, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I stopped doing that after that. I keep away. Just <laughs> have a paddle in your hands next time. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, biggest biggest girl, biggest hypochondriac. Right. Yeah, Ian Hunter. <laughs> I hope he's That's looking. Good <laughs> it, actually, you know, I don't, I don't think they are uh, out of rugby players. I'm not so sure they are. Uh, Hunts was always he had some proper horrible injuries, so you, you heightens your thres threshold to wonder what the hell's going on. You know, Josh, once you've pulled your hamstring, these these athlete rugby players, athletes are hypochondriacs, in my opinion. <laughs> I don't get, many, I don't get many athletes. Uh, this is track and field. I don't get many runners come to see me because I'm so strict with them. <laughs> I don't listen to them at all. I send them to Mark. Mark deals with the athletes um, and Matt Bergen. I can't, I can't, I can't do with them. They don't like me because I because I bully them a bit as well. <laughs> then, yeah, but um, no, Ian, poor Ian, he dislocated his shoulder. He, you know, he hurt his knee. His knee didn't do well post surgery, and then he, every time he played, he was brilliant. But every time he played, he came off his, with a new injury. Poor bloke. <laughs> can you call that hypochondria? Don't think you can. Can you? Or just man of, man of glass award. Is that <laughs> bloody good? He's still one of the best players, um, if not the best player we've had at Saints. You know, just brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish with that in case he's listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay, last couple of questions then. It's, it's, it's basically any, any kind of good luck uh, rituals or routines or, or beliefs, just quirky stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. With England, we had two. Um, one, we always train as a medical uh, performance team, s &C and and physios, on the day of the game. We flog ourselves before the boys got up really tough session really? and then, then we'd stop we'd shake each other's hands have a shower and we're ready for the game oh massive stress reliever for us brilliant yes otherwise but yeah so by the time the game i was so that's why i look so relaxed when i'm on the pitch side i was absolutely tired out <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. yeah that's that was what but then on the way to, we, sorry carry on yeah and on the way to the game um we would always stop one of us would buy it used to be five quid's worth of chocolates and they got a bit more and more and more and we'd eat them before the boys arrived as we were setting up the changing rooms. Because we, we always go early to set the changing rooms up and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that was another one. I used to like that, like that one. But we trained so hard in the morning, it didn't matter, did it? I learned it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, I suppose, funniest, funniest moment working for England rugby? Yeah, well, I got this one back to, uh, to Lewis Moody, back row player from uh, Leicester Tigers. Uh, went to Bath, I think. Yeah. Yeah, this was amateur days. I think we might be an amateur to professional. It was in that era. And uh, he is as daft as a brush. Great player, Lewis. But six foot three, bit massive blonde hair, yeah. always covered in blood, always falling out. Actually, never played now because every time he hit a tackle, he fell over. Um, yeah, but it's one of those. So he's, uh, he's coming for some treatment or other. I think Barney was treating him and put a nice, he'd got the game ready on his knee or something like that. And we left him there. I think we went quick. By to lunch, so we've um, he wanted just to chill in, in the treatment room, so we left him there for, for 20 40 minutes. We come back, he's fast asleep on the couch, he's got the Compex electro, stuck him on his face, and turned it off. And he's, <laughs> he's asleep on the couch, and his face is doing this. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? I'll see you later. Uh, unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, just I mean, just beggars belief, doesn't it? You know, we had no, I don't think we had any phones or cameras at that. That would have made yeah. a brilliant YouTube. <laughs> Wonder all this does. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, well, I, I can't thank you enough. For, so we're for the end. If that's the, the last of the a few, few questions we had, uh, we had briefed oh, in. But um, yeah, brilliant. Just well, I mean, we'll just finish with, you know, overriding thought from me is yeah. um, don't work in isolation. Uh, ask questions, talk to your colleagues. They invariably know something that you don't know, that you, a little nutshell that you can learn from, and try and work in, in the 
most integrated way you can within your practice. You know, don't hold on to your patients. Um, just uh, do the best for the client. Show them that you care. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's it. Thank Lovely. You. Oh, no, nice chat, Fred. Actually, enjoyed. Yeah, enjoyed that. Yeah. Great to speak to you. And um... I don't know if anybody else left here listening now, but. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs>